Hilma of Clint, a commentary on room 10 of the Tate Modern exhibition. In this video, I hope to introduce you to understanding the abstract paintings of Hilma af Klint. I will offer first a method for looking that can reveal their meaning to you, and second, my own interpretations of what I saw in this particular series. Hilma af Klint lived from 1862 to 1944. Her work was so groundbreaking that she asked that most of it not be shown till at least 20 years after she died. Since a major retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum, New York, she is recognised as the originator of abstract painting, preceding her male colleagues by a decade or more. Her work is so powerfully moving that the Guggenheim announced more visitors than to any previous exhibition. Some of the power of Afklint's work lies in what is not shown on the canvas. Her paintings are done in a series, so that each painting shows a progression on the theme in hand. It is the space between one painting and the next in that series that reveals the message she seeks to convey. Hilma says of her work, My mission, if it succeeds, is of great significance to humankind, for I am able to describe the path of the soul from the beginning of the spectacle of life to its end. Painting with direct guidance from her spiritual master, Amaliel, she often did not know how a given piece would turn out, and simply followed the impulse in her hand and eye to direct the next turn of the brush and colour selected. The result is paintings that depict levels of consciousness from pre-birth to after death, or from the awakening of the self to the final union with God. Each painting by itself is like a word in a sentence, and can only be fully understood in the context of its series. When the Tate Modern showed Af Klint's work alongside that of Piet Mondrian, they paid some tribute to Theosophy and to the teacher Rudolf Steiner, whom both artists saw as important in their work and personal development. It was only on visiting this exhibition that I saw her work shown in full sets and began to understand what she was saying. To be able to see the soul's development laid out in images like this is exceedingly profound. The great teachers like Blavatsky, Steiner, Yogananda and others lay this path out in words, but a new understanding dawns in the soul when the same description is given in colour and form. Her greatness could barely be perceived before, and even now is mostly seen in the historical precedent of her paintings, but will come to be understood in the profundity of her message. Though my own understanding was enabled by the Tate's faithfulness in setting out each series in full, I was still left floundering for a while by the power of this given series. In this video, I will contemplate the ten big ones, on first entering this last room in the exhibition, a room in which these ten took up all four walls, I was unable to grasp Hilma's message. It took me several minutes and rotations through the works to grasp her intent. In order that you may penetrate these meanings for yourself, I am playing each of these images for a few seconds. You can pause it if you want to spend more time. Allow the image to enter your feelings without imposing any explanation on any detail, and then scan your feelings for what arises. The series is described as tracing the growth of consciousness from childhood to the end of life, but as several are named the same, and some are unnamed, we are left free to discover what she is actually describing. Use this freedom to feel into your progress through developing states of consciousness from early childhood onwards and into where you hope to develop as you mature. In each series, 
there comes a point where I notice that my own development has been able to recognize the images so far, and that beyond that point, I have an idea from learning where she is going and what she is saying, but have no personal experience of the states being depicted. Does something similar happen for you? Do you remember the feelings of how the world looked when you were six, or fifteen, or twenty-two? So now I'm going to move on to my own perceptions from each painting. In this first painting, the background is a bluer tint than in the others. These background colours develop progressively as the series unfolds. The sole impact in the viewers of each colour lies in part in the fact that the eye reverses any image changing each colour to its opposite in the colour circle described by Goethe. To understand that, you need only gaze for several seconds at the colour, then switch your eyes to a blank surface, a wall or a ceiling usually works, and blink until you notice how the blue-green has changed to a warm pink. This afterimage, as Goethe called it, represents the soul's own experience of its environment. This pink you see in your afterimage could be compared to the pink you once saw through your mother's womb. This blue-green colour immerses the viewer in the pre-birth experience, while the two crowns of flowers, lilies and roses, also feature as spiritual imagery in Goethe's work. The fertilisation and dividing cell imagery all reflect on this moment of preparation for a new earth life. Another feature of this painting is the emphasis on the pastel yellow and blue. These represent the relationship between masculine and feminine, the ever fertile source of emergence from spirit into matter. The cosmic archetypes of masculine and feminine are full of symbolism themselves, such that feminine represents what has taken on form and now looks to the spirit for completion, whereas masculine represents what is approaching form and looks to matter for completion. Thus, we have the in-breath and the out-breath also within this polarity. These repeat throughout her works. In the second painting, you might feel how the very small child is fully immersed in the onrush of experience, joys, pains, delights, concerns crowd the upper part of the painting, supported below by the beginning integration of matter and spirit. All of this is set against a lighter blue background. The intensity of the experience of spirit is fading in the face of the sense-based experience. The third painting expresses the joys of the young child. No longer overwhelmed by the senses, play becomes the focus of the soul. Learning about this world we have entered is the engaging task of our development at this stage. You might sense in this one how Hilma too is devoted to play. Listening intently to Amaliel, she allows the forms to emerge like a child making mud pies. The overall feeling is richly childlike. In the fourth painting, things get a little more complicated, as they do when we enter the teen years and begin to experience the astral body complicating our feelings about life, ourselves and each other. Spirals enter into the blue and the yellow, indicating the possibility of procreation as each gender becomes a doorway for spirit into matter. Wild lines indicate the more complex emotions of this time. The fifth painting changes the background colour, taking on pink, the afterimage or opposite of that in the first painting. Feel into this. After the orange there is calm, some self-containment in this purpley pink colour. Wild lines have become balanced pairs. The snail becomes a butterfly. Harmonious containment is the order of the moment. This is the moment we enter into adulthood.
Everything is rich in potential. The sixth painting moves past the halfway mark in this series of ten. For me, this one reflects the late twenties, early thirties experience of confusion. We have applied our creativity, brought out our potential, and to our surprise, maybe even consternation, it has not solved all the world's problems. Instead, we've simply added to the chaos. Strange discombobulation appears all over. What to do? The answer appears in the next painting, when the world opens up to us as three, not as two. Once we cease trying to fix things and discover that they wish to be in relationship with us rather than controlled by us, harmony re-emerges. Now with a sense of flowering beginning as well. In this eighth painting, the threefold relationship with the world manifests in pink, becoming more of a background. Yellow, blue and pink now become co-creators of each other, as our co-creator relationship with the world reveals a host of new possibilities not previously dreamt of. Egg forms, double spirals, Circles of blue and yellow mooning at each other. The you of spirit and the double you of matter are part of the regular lexicon of Hilma Afkin's language that she scatters about this painting with fertile abandon. The ninth painting enters a mystical silence that speaks of the wisdom of age. Gone is the tendency to give too much advice or engage in unnecessary activity. Rich in peace, the images of sublime threefold wisdom and the reintegration of two halves into the spirit germ develop in a quiet fall of mirrored imagery. Gender is less important in the wise elder. Understanding has taken the place of perspective. The pink background is less purple, purer, spirit-imbued. Yellow and blue dance quietly together, below all else. The tenth painting is really quite a surprise. The geometry of the square, the cross and the nine takes powerful centre stage. Fecund swirls and a dance of yellow and blue are now overlaid only as fine lines or border images. We are invited to consider that when all is said and done, the journey of the self along the paths of life, of spiritual maturation, lead not to a glorified or even purified self, but to a non-dual unity with the structure of the universe. Logos holds the balance. Logos is the one central meaning of it all. Logos entertains and delights in the dynamic swirl of experience. But once the game is played, the race is run, as Leonard Cohen would say, our connection with God is far more important than any sense of identity. We become united at one without further struggle.